So I want to start with the definition of a metric space. So we've sort of, I didn't actually define an inner product space. I just sort of sketched the conceptual content. So let's actually start making definitions. OK, so I'm going to define metric space, and then we'll talk uh, at some length about various examples. So this is lecture two. So definition. So remember, metric space was the abstraction which captured the notion of Euclidean distance. OK, so a metric space is a pair consisting of a set and some function, and then some axioms. Now, but before I get into the rest of the definition, um, who here has taken a course or seen some sort of material on set theory? You look hesitant about the of set, set theory. theory. Yeah. Uh, who has seen the axioms of set theory? Okay, so one of you. Okay, so I mean that's fine, right? I mean for most of the mathematics you don't actually need to know what a set is. It just floats around as some sort of term which means synonymous, sort of like collection, right? Um, Although there are questions, even in the theory of metric spaces, which do hinge to some degree on non-trivial set theory. Uh, but of course, at this level, so we're going to actually be fairly careful about real analysis, because many of you have done that. Um, we're not going to be very careful about what set means, right? So it's, if you're curious about what set actually means, uh, you, know, you can go and look up zamello frankel set theory. <coughs> Um, there's some notes about that, for example, on my web page, but there's plenty of references for, for set theory. Okay, so anyway, a metric space is a pair consisting of a set and a function. So D for distance. And then we have four axioms. So first of all, the distance is non-negative. <laughs> Secondly, uh, the distance separates points. So the only pairs of points which are at zero distance are pairs where both elements are the same. Three, the distance is symmetric. And four, say that's called non-negativity, that's called separation, that's called symmetry. This is, of course, the triangle inequality. Okay, for the obvious sort of reason. Okay, so those are the axioms. That's what a metric space is. Uh, it's fairly clear that Rn, with the usual Euclidean distance, satisfies those. It's just maybe M4 that we have to check, but most of you have seen the proof of that already. So we'll go through the details of proving Rn together with Euclidean distance as a metric space, but that's sort of a tautological example. That's why we cooked up the definition in the first place. A more interesting question is, well, why these four axioms? I mean, the distance function in the Euclidean space maybe satisfies more. Why are these the most important things? And we'll discuss that by sort of looking at various natural examples where, for example, M1 through M3 is true, but M4 is not. Or even there are reasonable notions of distance, for example, between probability distributions, which are not symmetric, but still very useful. Okay. So it's not the case that you know, these are the only notions of distance that necessarily come up or are useful. But with these axioms, we can prove you know, important theorems like the uh, Banach fixed point theorem, which is coming up. 
OK, question one. Is the empty set a metric space? <laughs> right, yes. That's right, yeah. So if x is empty, there's no conditions, right? Because the quantification is over all elements of x, and there's no elements. Uh, maybe it's, I mean, the reason I asked if you've seen set theory before is if you haven't thought through set theory carefully, you might get the heebie jeebies when you see like empty set cross empty set. Uh, <laughs> that's actually okay. So it's just the empty set. <laughs> so let me just remark that. So, well, okay. I mean, we know what a function is, right? A function from between two sets. It's a subset of x cross y such that blah, right? Such that it satisfies the condition of a function. So if x is empty, what are the functions from the empty set to some other set? Well, they're all the subsets of x cross y such that blah, blah, blah. But, but the empty set cross with any set is the empty set. Because what's the Cartesian product? It's the set of all pairs where the first thing is in the first set, the second thing is in the second set. If there's nothing in the first set, there's no pairs. So we get the empty set again. OK, so what are all functions from the empty set to y? Well, they're all the subsets of the empty set such that blah, blah, blah. And all those conditions are trivial because there's only one subset of the empty set. Uh, but that is a function from x to y. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, okay, so there is a unique function from the empty set to x for any set x. And that's sort of just written into the fine details of what the definitions mean. So why am I talking about that? Well, it's because otherwise we'd be in trouble because there wouldn't be a, a metric on the empty set, right? If x is empty, empty set cross empty set is the empty set. There's a unique function from that to r, which is I mean, just the empty set of the empty, the empty subset of the empty set. And it tautologically satisfies these conditions. OK, so remark empty set with that function, that unique function, is a metric space. Now, that's not very interesting, obviously. Uh, but if I haven't spelled that out now, then I need to be careful later to say this is non-empty all the time, and I don't want to do that. OK, so we've discussed the empty metric space, and we never mention it again. <laughs> OK, uh, what's another uninteresting example? Well, the singleton. right? OK, so I take a one-point space, one-point set. What's the distance got to be? <laughs> right, by m2, I don't have any choice. Well, that better be true if it's going to be a metric. What about the other conditions? Yeah, m1's fine. m3, well, the only possible outputs of d are 0, so that's definitely true. And here, well, again, the only possible left-hand sides and right-hand sides are 0, so it's true. OK, so that's a metric space. Okay, less, I mean slightly less trivially, take x to be any set and define the distance between two elements to be 1 if they're different and 0 if they're the same. Okay, so you think of the, I mean, if these were lying in the plane, you sort of take the points of x and you're just arranging them sort of, I mean, in some high dimensional sort of circle, so they're all at the same distance, right? Okay, so does it satisfy the axioms? Yeah, well, one is true. Two, well, the predicate on the right hand side of that case by case is symmetric, so this must be symmetric. Uh, so this is true. What I just said explains this. Okay, what about M4? Uh, well, if you think about it, this, this is also clear. Right? Okay, 
So this is called the discrete metric. write it down, but implicitly this is a metric space, and that's called the discrete metric. That does come up, I mean, not usually in geometry or topology, but there's sort of combinatorial applications of that. Okay. Um, let's set up more interesting example, which we'll then spend the le rest of next lecture uh, discussing. Let's take the circle. So as I said, um, R2, or in general Rn, with the usual Euclidean distance, is a metric space. We'll check that carefully maybe next lecture. But let's you know, sort of just uh, eating our vegetables, so to speak. So we'll do that later. So that's true. So we, that's a metric space. If I have any subset of a metric space, it itself is a metric space under the induced metric. Okay? That is, I just take the distance between two points in S1 to be the distance between them in R2. So S1, D2 is a metric space where D2 just measures the distance in Rn, R2. So that's, and that's an exercise to check that any subset acquires a metric. Um, it's in the notes. So what's that saying? It's saying that if I take two points x and y in the circle, then the distance between them, well, that's just root 2, right? And that's the metric that I'm putting on S1 by using the restriction of the metric on R2. But it's probably not what we were expecting, right? I mean, if you want to talk about the circle and measure the distance between two points, you may have first thought about arc length rather than distance in R2, right? Because the distance in R2 is sort of about the embedding of the circle rather than being about the circle. OK, so this is, of course, pi uh, on the 2. Okay, so what's, now let's just think through the question of can we use instead the arc length to make S1 into a metric space? Okay, this will be a different metric because, well, for example, there's two points which will have a different distance compared to D2. Um, well, there's a little wrinkle, right, which is, well, is the distance pi on 2 or is it... I mean, there's two arcs which connect any two points. So I have to decide the length of which of them is going to be the actual metric distance in my proposed metric space. Well, we just take the minimum, right? Take the shortest distance between the two points moving along the circle as the notion of distance between, D, uh, between x and y. OK, so let me write that down. Um, so what am I going to write down? I'm going to write down, take two points on the circle and take the absolute value of the difference of their angles. That'll be the arc length, right? Or 2 pi minus that, whichever one is smaller. But I don't want to write down arc cosines and arc sines all over the place. So to save myself doing that, I'm just going to introduce the following bijection. So we use... This is just to avoid writing arc cosines. Right, 
So just parameterize the circle in the usual way. So here's the proposed metric. Okay, so D of x, y is going to be the minimum of, well, the difference between the two angles, but the angle associated to x is phi inverse x, right? This is a bijection. And the angle associated to y is this. And I take 2 pi minus that as well. OK, so that's arc length. All right, so the claim is that this is a metric.